Good afternoon. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the inaugural lecture in the Presidential Colloquium Series, Thinking Out Loud, Deciphering Mysteries of Our World and Beyond. Uh, I just first wanted to thank uh, the people who are really the driving force behind putting together this series. It's called Presidential, I think, just as a way to, I don't know why, because I really didn't do any of the work. Uh, and Professor Chris Rose, who many of you have probably met, is visiting here this year from Rutgers. Uh, he's a prof visiting professor of engineering, and he teamed up with Larry Larson uh, to put together what is really a, a, a great colloquium series. So I hope all of you will come to many of the, many of the events. Uh, to kick off the series today, we're pleased to have with us Professor John Johnson, professor of astronomy at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, I really like the idea of this series because it, it it's pulling in people who are asking really big questions and people at Brown have a, a, a liking for asking really big questions uh, in science, engineering, and mathematics. And so all of the lectures will feature scientists like Dr. Johnson who are giving these you know, really important talks, but in a way that it's accessible, I think, to a broader audience. Is that right? OK, good. Uh, you, you know, I would relate this to another series that we have, and to put in a plug for an up, upcoming talk, uh, this series is bringing in outstanding scientists from outside of Brown. Uh, there's another lecture series that I host, the Presidential Faculty Award Lectures, uh, that, that focuses on um, uh, uh, highlighting the work of our own faculty member, and there are two of those a year. Last year we had lectures from poet C.D. Wright uh, and philosopher Charles Larmore, and in November there will be a lecture by neuroscientist um, Professor David Burson. So, you know, we celebrate work that's being done outside of Brown, work that's being done in, uh, inside of Brown, so I hope I'll see you there too. Uh, one of the reasons why I love lectures like this, where they bring in people from many different areas of the university, is they remind us something that maybe sounds trivial, but that we often forget, which is there are actually real advantages of being part of a university. There are people around who are doing things that are different than what you're doing. And although all of us get very focused on what we do every day in our own fields, in our own areas of specialization, there's something really lovely about um, coming out to events where you can, you can stretch yourself and broaden yourself and find out what you have in common with people who you didn't think you did. Uh, we have four more speakers lined up in this series for the academic year. Next up, on November 13th, we'll welcome Professor Emery Brown, who's a professor of computational neuroscience at MIT and professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he's an anesthesiologist statistician who examines quantitative measurements of brain activity with an emphasis on one of the biggest questions, which is what is consciousness? Uh, in the spring, the Thinking Out Loud series will bring in Paula Hammond, Jim Gates, Richard Tapia to campus, and they'll have us thinking about everything from how to kill cancer cells in ways that are less toxic uh, through nanotechnology to exploring the fabric of the universe and bringing math to life, which we all knew it was lively anyway, but that's good. So anyway, I hope we'll, you'll join us at all of those, and I want to turn things over to Professor Rose, who will introduce the speaker. Thank you. Okay, so I'm completely new to this community, and uh, so I'm not sure exactly what to say. Uh, uh, president Paxson gave us a lovely introduction, you know, in a very presidential and inclusive sort of way, and it takes a special type of leader to let crazy people run symposia. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you look at my background and the sort of work that I've done, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. I can't think I've already said it. Um, so, but it's worse, right? Um, what President Paxson did say is that she didn't do anything. No, she didn't do anything she says, but she's, she is providing all the resources to make sure that this series happens, and that's not a little bit of something. So thank you very much, and thank Brown very, very much. But the danger there, you know, in good leadership is that when you invite crazy people in, they invite other crazy people in. <laughs> so each, uh, each of the speakers that uh, for this series, uh, they ask the big questions, and you only ask big questions when 
well, as I said, you're slightly nuts. Um, so John is, uh, you know, he's, he, he, I mean, look at him. He's, I'll tell you what his pedigree is. So he was at an undergraduate in physics at the at Missouri Rolla. Uh, then he went to Berkeley and uh, did a degree in astrophysics astronomy, I believe. Um, he did a postdoc. You know, he didn't like the weather in California. You know, it wasn't good enough, so he went to Hawaii uh, for a postdoc. Uh, and then he went to Caltech, you know. So, and... I want to say a little bit more about that, but the point here is that that's a pretty typical, you know, top drawer pedigree. But when you look at the way he approaches problems, it's a little bit nuts. Uh, he shouldn't be uh, an exoplanet uh, studier. Uh, he shouldn't be looking for planets. He should be looking at stellar evolution. That's where he started out. But he had a particular take on things that made looking at uh, exoplanets and finding them kind of interesting. And he's doing it in a different sort of way than other folks have. That's, uh, that's why he's won various prizes. Uh, two fellowships, Sloan and uh, Packard, which are very prestigious fellowships, especially for someone of such tender years, even though I notice he has one gray hair. I feel better now. <laughs> um, so I guess what I'm trying to say for all of this series, the, each of the individuals that you're going to see, they have an interesting story to tell. John is also no wallflower. He's all very outspoken about uh, some of the inequities that uh, occur for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, that's not the topic of this uh, particular lecture, but you know, he's, uh, you can go to his blog, uh, which uh, we'll post on the website afterwards. And um, I think that, you know, with that, that's uh, more than enough to introduce you to my crazy, brilliant friend, John Johnson. Thank you. I'm uh, actually, I am crazy in certain ways, but ways that Chris has never seen yet. Um, for today, I'm just going to be, I'll, I'll be a pretty standard lecturer, uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, what has become a standard topic, which is exoplanets, which are planets that orbit stars other than our own. Um, and they, this talk, when I normally give it, it has the title, uh, it's sort of a progressive looking, you know, forward looking title that's it's called Hot on the Trail of Warm Planets Around Cool Stars, which encapsulates everything that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, we are Plan I am uh, among the planet hunters. We look this, through the skies, we look around stars for other planets. Once we find those planets, we like to characterize their properties. We gather up those statistics, and I'll show you all about that. Um, we're, we have a particular interest in warm planets, and by warm, I mean temperate that are not too hot, not too close to their star, not too cold, but maybe just right for the conditions of life. And that leads to the actual this slightly revised title, which is Searching for Life. This is the ultimate goal of what we're doing when we're looking at planets. And uh, we're looking for them in the warmth of other suns, which is a title that I borrowed from a, a history book that I recently read by Isabel Wilkerson, which I highly recommend, which tells the remarkable and as thus, thus far untold story of the migration of six million Americans uh, from the south to the north from the period of 1900 to 1970. That would probably be for another day. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and f first of all, I'm going to provide motivation for why we look for planets around other stars. Uh, and then I'm going to show you some of the things that my group has been directly involved in, some of our discoveries and what we're learning about them. And then I'm going to conclude with a look towards the future about what we're going to do. Um, and since this is a science talk and not a mystery novel, I'm going to go ahead and give you the key points right up front. Um, so the first one is that we now live in an age where we know that there are at least two planets per star throughout the galaxy. Our galaxy has 200 billion stars. So we're talking, this is the old Carl Sagan's billions and billions. That's, well, he was referring to galaxies throughout the universe. I'm talking about planets in our own galaxy, our own little corner of the universe. And this is a lower limit. This is only bound to grow. And actually, in this talk, I've updated one of my slides to show you that this number might be considerably larger than two planets per star. Um, small planets, like our own. You might not think of the entire world as small. But compared to Jupiter, the gas giant, the, the king of our solar system, the Earth really does look puny, and especially compared to the sun. So our small planet is just about the right size to have a solid surface, to have an atmosphere that's not too thick as to be suffocating. It's just thin enough to protect, uh, that's just thin enough to allow us to view out and become aware of the cosmos that we live in. 
yet contain just enough of the protection from the sun and the oxygen we need to live. It's kind of a special place, but planets our size are far more common than those big gas giants that we have in our outer planetary system. And this is literally those first two points are statistical results. We know that from doing essentially a census of a very tiny part of the galaxy going around from star to star and asking, do you have a planet and how many? Um, but with those numbers, we know that these results should hold right up next door. And that's what's most exciting to me is that we've only begun to scratch the surface. I've given you two amazing results, but now we're hot on the trail of finding some of those temperate, potentially habitable planets around stars that are right next to our own sun. Some of the first stars that humans will travel to if we manage to make it far enough to advance that technology to that point. So one of the goals of exoplanetary science is to understand our origins. Uh, the study of cosmology is concerned with the origins of the entire universe. Exoplanetary science is on a much smaller scale. It's concerns uh, the origins of our own little tiny corner of the galaxy. And before there were planets that were known, based on our own solar system and the flatness of the planetary orbital planes and the fact that they orbit all in the same direction, led us to come up with a theory that in the beginning there was a young sun and surrounding that sun was a flattened distribution of gas and dust called a protoplanetary disk. And from this disk, via processes that we would like to better understand, the planets formed. Um, the smaller planets in close and the larger planets out further away from the sun. Um, here's a timeline that I've compressed by using orders of magnitude. So each step on here is 10 times longer or further along in the timeline than, that, than the previous step. It's a nice way of taking in a huge timeline, which is the age of our entire universe, or the age of the solar system in this case, 4.5 billion years, and pushing it onto this one slide so I can show you a couple of key points. Um, first, there was the collapse of, that, of a much larger collection of gas and dust called the giant molecular cloud. It started off, uh, the, uh, the, to give you a sense of scale, if that original molecular cloud from which the sun formed was the size of my body, then the resulting sun that formed out of it is about the size of a strand of DNA. That's pretty amazing. This is, astronomy's fun. So a cloud this big started out it started feeling its own self-gravity. Internal pressure wasn't enough to fight against gravity and it started collapsing and it formed our sun along with a bunch of other stars. Um, then as the material fell towards the central star, um, by conserving angular momentum and minimizing energy, uh, it was able to form a flattened distribution. That's the protoplanetary disk, planets formed in there, especially the gas giants. Um, then, after some period of time, the material in the disk dissipated. It was blown away by intense stellar winds. Some of it accreted and fell onto the star itself. And eventually, all of the gas and dust went away. And then the planets saw each other. And then, kind of all hell broke loose because the planets all started gravitationally interacting. There was a big period of jostling. And then, what was left was the final architecture of the planetary systems that we see today, along with our solar system. And that happens way over here. Now, the compressed time scale that I've given you here is misleading because if this all represented 24 hours and we are sitting over here today at 11.59 p.m., then all of this action took place in the first five minutes of the day. So that's what makes it really difficult. All of the action in planet formation happens in a blink of an eye and then it's over and then you have the end results. So our job is to go from what we can currently observe and try to put together a story that matches, that makes predictions and leads to a universe populated by planets that we find today. The next goal is to gain a much broader context for our own solar system and ultimately for ourselves. This is kind of a planetarium lineup of the planets, not to scale, obviously. Uh, but again, I need to fit it onto a slide. And based on this architecture of this solar system, uh, of our solar system, before there were exoplanets, we told ourselves, we came up with some amazing stories. Stories that fit really well. Stories that led to this result, that there are small planets in close and big planets out far away, and we felt quite good about our stories. But this was problematic. 
uh, and I bet you can figure out why without too much thought. We came up with a theory that was based on a sample of one. And that would be like putting together, doing a study of sociology by looking at yourself. Anything you come up with will match very well, and it probably doesn't apply to anyone else. So we thought we knew that these planets in here um, were very small because the inner protoplanetary disk was so close to the star that it was very hot, and the material in the disk was very rarefied. So it was very difficult to get the building blocks stuck together to form planets. So this was a very long process that really only used the dregs of the planet formation process. The very leftover dust in the disk went into forming the terrestrial planets. As you move further out in the protoplanetary disk, you get far enough away from the sun where you cross the so-called snow line within the disk, where volatile materials like ices can freeze out and become solid and somewhat sticky. And those solids and stuck together and through kind of a built up into dust bunnies and then built up into pebbles and then into boulders and then into planetary cores which then rapidly pulled in gas and formed these gas giant planets out here. Then what we think what happened out here was that these planets were going around so slowly, they were so far away from the sun, that that build up process was very slow. And it kind of retarded their growth and they ended up with these smaller gas giant planets or the so called ice giants. That's what we thought we knew. This has been thrown complete, this understanding has been basically thrown out the window and have to start all over again because of the planets that we found and I'll show you why in a few slides from now. Now, this next slide, if somebody were to stand up here about 20 years ago and say that we are looking for life in the universe, well, first of all, they wouldn't be up here in this, on this stage. Because um, that was the topic of science fiction. But now I can, with a straight face, address this loud, large crowd of people interested in science, and I can say that we are, this is one of our overarching goals. And the reason why, well, it should be obvious why life and planets are intimately linked, because planets, unlike all, any other astronomical object out there, unlike black holes, which are very neat, white dwarfs, neutron stars, entire galaxies, giant molecular clouds, planets are places. Planets are places throughout the galaxy where you can imagine traveling to, taking a step out of your spacecraft and stepping onto another surface, taking a look around, and maybe searching around for life. And I love this illustration of a nice verdant moon that's orbiting a gas giant planet with another potentially habitable moon interior to it and the sun further out. This might well be a real planetary system, or representative of a real planetary system out there. And it's my goal to be among the scientists who discover these places that harbor life. So these are the three overarching goals that I can think of. These are what motivate me. We want to know our origins, we want to gain a much broader context, and we want to search for life. And as scientists, when we have these goals in mind, we proceed by asking questions. And so some of the questions we ask is, or ask are very basic. Do planets of a given type exist? And when we started off, we used our examples on our own solar system. And so we first asked, do Jupiters exist? Then once we found more than one planet, we start building up a large statistical sample. And then we can start taking that collection of planets and drawing statistical inferences. We can take this collection of planets and their properties and we can devise models for planet formation and ask, do those models end up looking like this collection of planetary systems? And finally, every once in a while when you have this large collection, you go rummaging through your bin O planets and you find a real jewel this special little planet that is, because of its star and its proximity to the Earth and the properties of the planet itself, allows us to do detailed studies of its characteristics, all the way down to studying its atmosphere and how material winds are moving through its atmosphere. And that's something we can do. So the technique that was used to find the first planet is illustrated here. It's known as the Doppler technique. And it takes advantage of the fact that Planets don't actually orbit stars. Planets and stars orbit their mutual center of mass. And this is because of, uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So even though the star is planning, pulling on the planet, the planet is tugging back on the star. And their motion will be proportional to their mass. 
So even, so the planet moves very noticeably, which is why we usually think of planets just orbiting stars, but the star is actually displaced as well. And if you look at the star's speed or velocity along our line of sight, you'll see it going away and then towards, away and then towards. And it's that back and forth motion or that change in its velocity that belies the properties of the planet orbiting. When I was at Caltech in Hawaii before that, in Berkeley before that, I had access to some of the world's largest telescopes. At Harvard, I have access to a different set of telescopes. But let me just show you, about the, these are the Keck 10 meter optical telescopes. They're twins. Um, the one that has the spectrograph I use is right here, Keck 1. It's on top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which is why I went to Hawaii. It was the weather, yes, but also 10 meter telescopes. Um, the power of these telescopes comes in their large apertures. The larger the size of the telescope, the more light you can gather, the more stars' velocities you can measure per night, and the more planets you can find. And so these were wonderful workhorse instruments, uh, particularly the one with the spectrograph on it there. And the way it works is, this is just a quick illustration, particularly for the, those the technically inclined in the room that shows you how a spectrometer works, is that we take the starlight, instead of just taking a picture of the star, we actually take the point of light from the, from the star, we pass it through a slit, it comes over here and hits this um, collimating optic, so all the rays of light running parallel to each other, and then it hits this thing called an shell grating that has these grooves. And if you've ever held a Blu-ray disc up to the sun and you see the rainbow pattern, that's actually diffraction, similar to what a prism does. But it's, it's using almost the same optical properties, but it uses a grating instead of this wedged piece of glass. And so that, what that does is it sends wavelengths of light into different directions. So it takes this white light and it spreads it out into its constituent colors. Then we hit another one of these gratings, and that spreads it out into what's called an echelogram. Instead of this spectrum running from one end of the room to the other end of the room, because it has so much power to disperse the light, we instead just chunk it into little segments and stack them one on top of the other so they can fit on a nice square uh, CCD detector, similar to what you might have in your camera phone. So we take a picture of the star's spectrum, and this is what it looks like. This is, has color added, so normally it's just black and white, and that's how I'm used to looking at it. And it's kind of fun when you're a spectroscopist because you feel like that scene in the matrix where you're saying, oh yeah, I look at that and I see sodium and magnesium and calcium and hydrogen. And there, there's Earth's atmosphere actually right in there. It's kind of neat. And you can use this spectrum to measure the line depths and you can actually figure out exactly what the star is made out of to high precision. So I can tell you that, you know, 0.001% of the star's atmosphere is comprised of chromium. Kind of neat. Most of it's hydrogen, and then a lot of helium, and then trace elements, the heavy elements that form us, are embedded in these stars. And it turns out that when these stars die, they blow all that stuff back out into space so it can be recycled into planets later. It's kind of neat. We're star stuff. Um, but that's a totally different story. For what I do, we need to take a closer look at this spectrum. And so instead of figuring out what the star is made out of, I actually look and see what these lines are doing in time. And these lines are tied to atomic transitions that have very precise wavelengths. And I know exactly what wavelength that line should have. And if I watch that line move in time, it's moving because it's being Doppler shifted by the motion of the star. As the star moves away from us, the waves of light get stretched out, and that line moves over into the red slightly. And as the star moves towards us, those wave press get squished together, kind of like a slinky, and then it moves to the blue. So we measure the blue shifts and then the red shifts of that star, and we can see the gravitational effect of the planet orbiting it. And it's one thing to say it, and it sounds actually kind of impressive when I say it. I like saying it. Um, but <laughs> What we're actually measuring is a line that spans about three or four of those pixels, and we're measuring its shift to about one one thousandth of a pixel. And a pixel is about 15 microns. 15 microns is less than the width of a, of your, of a hair. So we're actually measuring these lines moving by about 80 silicon atoms lined end to end, which is 
why it's so much fun to try to do it. And it's why it didn't happen until pretty recently. Uh, especially considering that all of this is on a moving platform called the Earth. So when we first asked, do they exist, what we had in mind by they, we meant Jupiter-sized planets because we know that Jupiter would cause the largest reflex motion. If you were looking at our sun, you would see it move primarily because Jupiter's tugging on it. So it was natural to ask, let's see if we can catch the low-lying fruit or grapefruit or whatever. And when we asked, do they exist, we got our answer pretty quickly. We saw... I say we, I should say Michel Mayor and his student uh, Didier Quello. And it was later verified by my uh, PhD advisor, Jeff Marcy, and his student, Jeff, or sorry, Paul Butler. And what they saw was the star's velocity changing in time. Here, each one of these measurements is a trip up the mountain to use the telescope. And you measure one velocity of the star per night. And you come back the next night, and maybe you stay there for a week, and then you go back home, and you come back, and you measure them again. And then this is the best fitting model that shows a nice sinusoidal back and forth motion because the planet is tugging on the star. So that's cool. That looks exactly like what you would expect for Jupiter. Except for one thing. If anybody looked down here at this axis, you'll see that instead of being measured in years, it's measured in days. And this Jupiter-sized planet has an orbital period of 4.2 days, which means its year is 4.2 Earth days long. Not a great place to pay your taxes. <laughs> so the amplitude of this signal is directly proportional to the mass of the planet, provided that you know the mass of the star, which is how I got interested in this. For every detection technique, you find a signal. That signal is caused by a planet, but to unlock the properties of the planet, you have to have a key, and that key is called the properties of the star it orbits. So measuring stellar properties is how I got into this game. And it's one of the more fun things I like to still do. I'm a planet hunter by night, stellar astrophysicist by day, I guess. So there you have it. Existence was proven. Do they exist? We have a Jupiter-sized planet parked right next to its star. And it was very hot, and then astronomers were very clever, and they just called them hot Jupiters. <laughs> That's what they're called. And these hot Jupiters confused everybody. How do you, I, I just told you that whole story where you can't form giant planets in close to the star, right? And you all nodded and you bought that story. We did too. And here is a gas giant planet, the biggest of the planets parked right next to its star. So who ordered that? Well, it turned out this guy ordered that, Otto Struve. 1952. I went digging through the literature. This actually turns out to be one of my academic great-grandfathers. Um, if you follow my advisor's advisor, he was that advisor. And he said, but there seems to be no compelling reason why the hypothetical stellar planets could not, in some instances, be much closer to their parent stars than is the case in our solar system. It would be of interest to test whether any, there are any such objects. Indeed. We know that stellar companions, so there are binary stars, stars that orbit each other, can exist in very small distances. It's not unreasonable that a planet might exist in a distance of 1 50th of an astronomical unit. Its period would be about a day. Wow, Otto. Later on, he came to the conclusion that if the planet is that close to its star, then there's a high geometric probability that it will be aligned such that it passes between us and the star. It'll eclipse. And he said there would, of course, also be eclipses. Okay, wow, that was pretty sweet. And then he went, I also foresee a dark fellow, a short stature. <laughs> <who will> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 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 he didn't do that. Would have been amazing though, right? <laughs> so after you find one, I told you you'd like to collect many. You'd like to build up a nice sample of planets and then see if that sample tells you any interesting stories. And after time, we did find many planets and we were able to put them into bins of mass and each one of these bins uh, is measured in Earth masses. So this is about 1,000 Earth masses down to about here. This is a Jupiter-sized. This is kind of Saturn, Neptune. This is nothing like it in our solar system, but it turns out there are a lot of these so-called super-Earths, about 10 times the mass of the Earth. And then here are the Earth-sized, or slightly Earth-sized planets. Here's truly Earth-sized. And you'll notice that very early on with the initial planet detections, we found that even though the more massive, the bigger planets are easy to easier to detect, it turns out that there's more of the small ones. Small planets are more common than big planets throughout the galaxy. 
And this is the first tantalizing hint that we got at this. We published this in a 2010 paper. And with a careful extrapolation uh, into this next bin over, we figured there should be about 25% of stars have an Earth-sized planet, Earth's mass planet. That was a big claim. That was way back in ancient history, back in 2010. Uh, and we kind of went out on a bin, on, on a limb, <laughs> went out on a bin. We went out on a limb <laughs> with that extrapolation because it did require us going into a bin where we didn't have any data. It turns out that we underestimated, so we did a pretty good job. And then sometimes you can learn about the detailed properties. Now this is an image of the star the way a spectroscopist might look at it, like myself. Instead of just seeing a nice orange ball shining in space, it's actually rotating. So part of the star is heading towards you, and part of the star is going away from you, and normally that all averages out. So it doesn't really matter that it's got this rotational component. But imagine that you have one of those transiting planets that Otto Struve predicted, and it passes in front of the star. Well, what it will do is normally, if it's going in the same direction of the star, it will block the blue limb first, followed by the red limb. And if you measure the velocity of the star, it will it look like the star does a little jig as the pa planet passes in front of it. And that jig kind of looks like this. It's an anomalous Doppler shift. It's just because part of the star doesn't average out with the other part of the star. And so we did a lot of these measurements, and here's one of the most interesting measurements we made, which showed that the star went this way, it went blue shifted, and then red shifted, which was very weird. That meant that the planet was orbiting the star backwards. So not only do you have a Jupiter-sized planet in a three-day orbit around a sun-like star, but that planet decided to go the other direction for some reason. And that told us something about how those planets get to where they are right next to their star. It wasn't a gentle process. It was a very radical change in that planet's entire lifestyle. So it not only moved in close, but somehow it was kicked in such a way that its orbit flipped over and then it ended up close to its star. And that's an important constraint when you come up with theories for how to move the planet inward. The initial theories just thought, oh, it's a nice gentle mechanism. It goes in with the protoplanetary disk and kind of parks itself there. Mm. Now it's a really crazy dynamical picture there. So <clears throat> here's the checklist um, as of about 2010, 2011, is that um, we pretty well characterized and understood a lot of those questions about the Jupiter-sized planets. And what left us wondering was what happens if you start moving way down in mass? Astronomers always love to push the frontiers, and the frontiers for exoplanets are smaller, less massive planets. So let's see what we can do about understanding the large statistical ensemble of Earth-sized planets and maybe see if any of them give us any information about their detailed properties. And for this enterprise, we use a space telescope, a space telescope called the Kepler Space Telescope. And this is an absolutely beautiful feat of, of engineering, in my opinion. A lot of space telescopes are kind of like Swiss Army knives. They have lots of different instruments you can swap in and out, lots of different filter combinations you can put in place. You can point them all over the sky. You can drive them around. Well, not really drive them around, but basically there's a lot of flexibility. But what I love about the Kepler Space Telescope is that it is so single-minded and so simple in its, in its mission. It's designed to measure the brightnesses of stars over and over and over again. And as such, it has no swappable instruments, no filter wheels, just a one meter uh, primary aperture. Light passes in here, it hits a mirror back here, it bounces up to this gigantic focal plane lined with CCDs. This is what it looks like on the sky, projected onto the sky. Each rectangle is 2,000 by 4,000 pixels, which leads to something like a 300 megapixel camera. And this thing is absolutely macroscopic. Um, I don't have a picture in this, in this version of the lecture, but it's about, the whole detector is about this big. It's huge. And it grabs a huge part of the sky because only a fraction of all existing planets have the right orientation to eclipse. So let's say every single star had a planet, like a hot Jupiter, well, only one-tenth of those would show a transit. So you'd need to look at 10 stars to get one detection. So it's all in the numbers. So Kepler, what it does is it looks at one part of the sky, and it did so for four years, and every 30 minutes it took an image of that part of the sky, and then you can go in and measure how much light arrived from each star, and then you piece together a time series of that star's brightness. And that 
time series is kind of illustrated with this cartoon here. So as the planet orbits the star, when it's outside of the star's disk, nothing happens. But when it passes in front, you get this tiny little blip. And this little diminution of light, the depth of it gives you the ratio of the area of the planet to the area of the star. So it gives you radius of the planet divided by the radius of the star squared. And once you measure consecutive blips, then you can get the period of the planet. And there's a whole lot of other information encoded in this light curve. But key to getting it all out is understanding the properties of the star. It's a theme I'll keep coming back to. Now Kepler, um, after four years of successful operation, was approved for an extended mission. My group had submitted targets. We were very excited about looking at these new targets. We had a whole slate of science lined up. And I told you that Kepler didn't have any moving parts, but that was kind of not true because it actually had three reaction wheels. And those reaction wheels kept it stabilized in this direction, this direction, and this direction. And one of those wheels failed. Friction built up, and then it came to a screeching halt, and then the spacecraft wasn't able to stabilize itself anymore. Kepler, rest in peace. But the genius engineers at Ball Aerospace and at NASA realized that, wait a second, we still have two degrees of control. We can control it like this, and we can control it like this. So this and this. And if we need to control it like this, we actually have on the back of the spacecraft, there's a ridge line produced by the solar panels. And if you take that ridge line and you orient it into the stream of stellar photons, photons have momentum. And so that acts like a stream of water going over the bow of a boat. And you can actually stabilize yourself into the nice little stream of photons. Yay, physics. <laughs> and what that does actually is it opens up brand new science opportunities. Um, because Kepler formally was restricted to looking at only one field of view, but with this new one, we actually have to keep moving around the ecliptic as it orbits the sun, so every 75 days we get to look at a new field. So one of our wishes came true. Uh, Kepler was revived, that was the big wish. And our second wish was that we got to actually aim the telescope for the first time. So this is a really exciting new era of Kepler. Now, the the title of this talk used to be about the cool stars, and so I'm going to give you a quick rundown of stellar spectral types. Astronomers never do anything easy, so we name, uh, we have stars broken down into categories based on classifications that were done in the early 1900s. And it starts off over here with these gigantic O stars, then B, A, F, G, K, M, and then you also get the L dwarfs, T dwarfs, and now the Y dwarfs. So the mnemonic is O, B, uh, fine, guy or girl, kiss me lovingly tonight, yeah? <laughs> That's what I teach my intro students. It never fails, they all know their spectral type now. And our sun is a G-type dwarf. Procyon, if you know that, in the night sky is an F dwarf. Vega is a really beautiful blue star in the, in the, in the winter sky. It's uh, an A-type dwarf. Um, but I'm really interested in these things. You don't see a single one of these M dwarfs in the night sky because they're too small and too faint and too red. They're very small. They have about masses of about half down to 10% to the mass of the sun. Same for the radius. The radii are about half to 10% the radius of the sun. Um, and they put out only a, like a fraction of a percent of the total lum uh, luminosity of our sun. So there are tons of them though. This is a breakdown of our solar neighborhood in a one nice little graphic. This, if you look within about 30 light years of the sun and grab that entire volume surrounding the sun and count it up all the stars, this is what you would see. You see a bunch of little white dwarfs. These are skeletons of dead stars. These big ones are the A stars, the F stars, G stars like our sun, so there's a good number of them. And then there's the K stars, but look at all these M stars out here. The M stars make up 70 to 75% of all of the stars in the galaxy. So when you look up at the night sky, you are not seeing a representative picture of the galaxy. You're seeing only the brightest stars, and some of them are the rarest types of stars, as it turns out. If you had infrared goggles, though, you would look up in the sky and you would see, first of all, seven times more stars, and they would all be little red dwarfs. So I'd like to think of them as the silent majority of our galaxy. Now, there are a lot of advantages. Even though they are much fainter, 
Um, they make up for that in being very numerous. But they also have other advantages in terms of detection. So if you're using the transit technique, you have, you have a, say, an Earth-sized planet transiting a sun-like star, then you get a light curve that looks something like this. And that same planet around a red dwarf, because the transit depth goes as the radius of the star squared, or one over the radius of the star squared, you get that. So you get a huge signal. Same size planet, just looking around a different size star. Another advantage is that if you are looking for planets that orbit within the temperate region around their star, the so-called habitable zone, which I feel is a little bit of a loaded term, so I came up with a separate term, uh, the zone of constant range of temperature equilibrium, or ZOCRO, TM. <laughs> I put that up there just because I feel like the habitable zone is very loaded. It, it implies just because the planet has the right temperature that you're going to just find life there. That's not really true. We don't really even understand the conditions for life on our own planet. I should just make that clear. Um, but we do call it the habitable zone because it, you know, it really makes headlines. It's a sexy term. Um, but it, in our own solar system, it ranges from, you know, just outside the orbit of Venus out to um, right about where the Earth is, I believe, yeah, is that right? Yeah, anyway, for a sun-like star, this is about the extent of the, of the, of the so-called habitable zone. And because the M dwarfs are less luminous and much cooler, that habitable zone moves in very dramatically. So this is an M-type dwarf that's about 20% the mass of the sun, called GJ1214, it might be your favorite star too. And the habitable zone is in very close, which has two consequences. If you're looking for transits for this habitable zone planet, you have to wait every year to see one blip. And God help you if your telescope happens to fail at that moment. Over here, though, you get transits every 7 to 20 days. So you get to see many more transits go by per observing season. And the other consequence is that, remember, that geometric transit probability goes as the radius of the star divided by the semi-major axis. And so the closer you are, the more likely you are to transit or to be seen in transit from an observer on Earth. So these are more likely to transit. And all of those advantages add up to having these little faint, little tiny M dwarfs, excuse me, that nobody's ever seen with their own eyes. They turn out to be the best targets for looking for planets. The trick is characterizing the properties of the star. I'm going to run through this a little, kind of quickly, but I, I put this in there just for any spectroscopist in the crowd or anybody that's wondering how exactly we do this. First of all, you start with a big telescope. Uh, for this, we didn't use the Keck telescope. We actually used the five meter Palomar telescope, which is um, just south of uh, Caltech in Pasadena, uh, close to San Diego. And we use an instrument on it called triple spec, which is a great name for an instrument. Um, triple because it actually takes uh, three different bands of spectrum in one shot. And what we're looking for in these spectra are a couple of different features. Um, first of all, when you, in the infrared wavelengths, this triplet set of lines is due to uh, calcium, and these, this doublet set of lines is due to sodium. And they're very sensitive to the total amount of heavy elements in the star's atmosphere. And even though the heavy elements form only a tiny fraction of what's in the star itself, it has a huge de uh, determination on the size of the star. There's, there's reasons for that I can go into later. But the more metals you have, the puffier your star is. And the less metals you have, the more compact the star is. And the other thing that determines how big or small the star is is its temperature. And all of these features actually are real. That's not noise. And a lot of that is caused by water absorption. And water absorption is very sensitive to temperature. And all of this was painstakingly calibrated um, by this woman here, Barbara Rojas Ayala, um, who came up with this very clever technique. Because actually modeling that full spectrum is currently intractable. It's formed by billions of atomic and molecular transitions that we still haven't worked out in the laboratory yet. But she's able to say, oh, forget the exact details of it. Let's just calibrate the bulk features, which really opened up this whole project for us. And here are lines of constant radii for different model stars that we were able to construct on our computer. And it can project them as a function of temperature and metal content. And so here's where our measurement is. And we can just plop it down on this plot and basically read off based on these colors. Actually, we, we do it much more precisely with actual numbers. But for the sake of this exercise, we can look at its crossing about the green here, which corresponds to a radius of about 0.35 times the radius of the sun. 
And this is, only really works for M dwarfs or red dwarfs. The red dwarfs are characterized almost uniquely by their metal content and their effective temperature because it turns out that even though they're small and therefore they don't have a lot of fuel, they're extremely fuel efficient. And every single M dwarf that has ever been born throughout the entire age of the universe is still around today. And it will still be around after the last sun-like star dies and as long as all the other galaxies redshift away and the galaxy becomes dark, there will still be M dwarfs working and sipping on their tiny little bits of hydrogen fuel. It's really cool. So the last places to live in our galaxy, just this is a heads up, <laughs> will be M, around the M dwarfs. Um, so now I'm going to show you a few results. Um, one of the most exciting discoveries was this one uh, that was romantically named Kepler-42. Um, it is a small star with high proper motion and three suburbs. And I'll tell you a little bit about why we, this is the title of the paper. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so first for some backstory. Um, back when we were first looking at the red dwarfs that were observed by Kepler, we were puzzling over exactly how to get the most precise stellar measurements so that we can get the best planetary measurements. And one of the stars that was really puzzling for us, uh, well, one of the planetary systems was this Kepler-42 one. And um, here is a nice lineup of all the multiple planet systems discovered by Kepler. Wow, okay. And way down here at the bottom was this Kepler object of interest 961. This is what its designation was before it officially became Kepler-42. Real upgrade in name, right? Um, and it had what looked like three gas giant planets all orbiting with orbital periods less than two days. And we looked at that and we just thought, what? That, that is just no way. Because remember I told you that the, the planets, when they see each other gravitationally, can become unstable on very short time scales. So we ran some simulations of this planetary system and we couldn't keep it together for longer than 100 years. The planets would just toss each other apart, one would fall into the star, one gets tossed out, the other one goes into a high eccentricity orbit, and all chaos broke loose. Um, so we thought that this would be a good poster child for testing our, our, our measurements of stellar properties because maybe the star's properties were wrong, which led us to get the planet properties wrong, which led us to ask what? So as we were puzzling over this, it turned out there was another astronomer puzzling over it. And this astronomer was not what you would call a professional astronomer because he doesn't work at a university and he doesn't get paid for his astronomy. Um, but he's, he's really good at what he does. His name is Kevin Apps. He lives in England. He works at the uh, UK Gas Works, which pipes gas from the North Sea down all the way all throughout Great Britain. And what's really special about Kevin is that he has an amazing ability to catalog things in his mind. So for his job, he can look through banks of computer screens and dials and readouts and say, yep, everything's in order. And he goes back to reading preprints of astronomy paper on his computer. <laughs> so he just he gets his astronomy intake every night at work. Um, the other thing that he can do is when he's looking at those papers, he's, he's able to ingest and hold in his brain various catalogs and kind of cross-list the uh, same entries. So you could say, hey, Kevin, Gliese 699. And you could say, oh yeah, Gliese 699. That's a high proper motion star in the northern sky. It's got colors of blah. It's got this magnitude. It's also known as Barnard star, discovered in 1910. And it's just really cool parlor tricks. But it also makes for amazing science, as you can see. He uh, won the Astronomy Society of the Pacific Amateur Achievement Award. He's the author of 25 refereed publications. He's got 49 planet discoveries to his name. This guy is no joke. And so he sent me an email and he's like, hey, I'm really puzzling over this KOI 961. You might have noticed it too. It doesn't look like it's stable to me. Um, but I was wondering if you noticed that that star is almost an identical twin to Barnard's star. And I wrote back, uh, no, only you notice those things, Kevin, but please go on. <laughs> and what was really important about his insight is that Barnard star is the second closest stellar system to the Earth. And it is the one red dwarf that we know anything about. It is close enough that we can actually measure its diameter on the sky with a large enough telescope. You can actually kind of go like that and you can say that's its angular diameter. We know the distance to it with a little bit of trigonometry. You can measure the stellar diameter directly, not having to rely on all those models. And the fact that this thing was a twin meant that we could maybe just transfer over Barnard Star's well-measured properties over to this interesting object. Uh, 
I wish I could say that I just totally trusted Kevin and we proceeded right away, um, but no, we invested about um, $100,000 worth of uh, telescope time to get a spectrum to double check. And here is a spectrum in the infrared of Barnard Star, which is in, uh, well, one of them's Barnard Star and one of them's KOI 61 and look, they're the same. And you can't get the same spectrum. The star's spectrum is like its fingerprint. And look at every one of the little bumps. Whenever Barnard Star, oh yeah, Barnard Star is black. It goes high, 961 goes high. When it goes low, same thing. It only starts to mismatch down here, but that's easy to do with small tweaks to the elemental abundances in the atmosphere, which we did. And we were able to take the known properties of Barnard Star, transfer them over, and we were able to solve this one system right away using this kind of stellar proxy. And when we did this, the star became much, much, much smaller than the catalog that it was originally listed in. It was listed in the Kepler input catalog. And there was a caveat in the Kepler input catalog that said this only basically works for sun-like stars. If you ever try it for M dwarfs, beware. Caveat emptor. And we, we, we knew that this was a problem. And this is what led us down this path. So no, no, no disrespect to the Kepler team, they weren't looking for planets around M dwarfs. But once we did, it became much smaller. When the star shrinks, the planet shrunk as well. And then everything started making sense and then things got really excited because we figured out that those planets shrunk so much that they became the three smallest planets that had ever been discovered. So here's a lineup of, that includes the Earth and Mars, the two previous record holders, Kepler 20F and Kepler 20E, and here's the Kepler 42 system. All three of the planets are smaller than the Earth and the smallest one is about the size of Mars. So this was really exciting. Um, when we did the press release for it, we wanted to kind of show this tiny system to scale because remember the outer, the longest period in that system is 1.8 days. The closest one is about 10.8 hours. So we wanted to show it to scale. This is a microplanetary system. So we started thinking like, what about the first hot Jupiter that was ever discovered? And we tried to plop it on this slide. The star is this big over here. The planet is over here. It didn't really fit. And so what we did instead is we realized, wait a second, actually we can find a pretty good match if we compare this star and its planets to our giant planet, Jupiter, and its Galilean satellites. That's about the scale of the system. The only thing I've done is tweaked the scales of the semi-major axes to fit onto here, but that's the size of the star compared to Jupiter. It's only about 70% larger. And here are the planetary orbits and sizes. So this is a star orbited by three planets that looks like our gas giant planet orbited by its moons. And this is a theme that repeats itself around the smallest stars in our sample. They start looking a lot like planets orbited by moons, which is telling us something really loud, but not very clear. <laughs> um, but it is giving us some clues about how these little miniature planetary systems might form. This is the system compared to the sun. You can compare the orbits to the size of the sun. This is the sun. This is the orbit of the inner planet at 10.8 hours. And this is the outer planet D at 1.8 days. Now, even though those orbital periods are very short and they're very close to their star, it turns out that the habitable zone is only about up to here. So these things are perched just inside of the habitable zone for this particular star. Now, <clears throat> we wanted to take systems like uh, Kepler-42 and all the other systems that we found around M dwarfs and we wanted to start drawing statistical inferences, right? Once you found one, then you want to find many and you want to use that collection to draw conclusions. And to do this for transiting planets, you have to account for the fact that for every one that you see, there are lots that you miss because they're not oriented in space just right to have eclipses. And so there's the one only a fraction of them transit. And um, I remember actually doing the, the press release and they were interviewing me on the phone for one of the local radio stations. And uh, I was just like, I was trying to convey it. The, the, the person interviewing me was like, kind of like, oh, but we, so wait a second, I don't understand. How is it that you, f you see one and, the, and then there's many? And I was just, uh, it's like cockroaches, right? You see one and there's all these ones that you're missing. And that's the one that made it to the final print. <laughs> And then I drew a lot of flack from my colleagues for making planets sound like cockroaches and uh, whatever. Got to be careful. 
Um, but once we did this careful accounting for the random viewing geometry and the fact that if you see a planet around one star, you might have missed it around other stars because they're fainter or they're much larger. So we do a careful correction for all of these reasons that we might have missed planets. And then we take into account all of their sizes and my student Tim Morton and my postdoc John Swift did a really nice statistical study of all of Kepler's planets around M dwarfs when they found this diagram that looks a lot like that one I showed you before that shows that small planets, this is planet size or radius in Earth radii, these smaller planets are much more common than large planets, even around these tiny stars, which is very exciting. And look where the peak is. The peak is somewhere right around the size of the Earth. And so for these M dwarfs, they don't even really have Jupiters very frequently at all. Jupiters are pretty rare around the M dwarfs. Um, for most systems, the gas giant is something the size of Neptune. That's the big monstrous planet in the system, but that doesn't even occur very often. But this is what the distribution of planets looks like throughout the galaxy. There are tons of terrestrial worlds out there and some fraction of them lie just the right distance away from their star to potentially harbor life. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. Now speaking of systems, one of the prototypical planetary systems in our sample is named Kepler-32, not to be confused with Kepler-42. And this, um, for various reasons, we've determined to be what the typical outcome of planet formation throughout the galaxy looks like. So let me just show you what its architecture looks like on the screen here. So, and the center is a star that's about half the radius of the sun. The inner planet has an orbital period of 0.7 days or about 1% of the Earth-Sun distance. So it's in very close. Then as you move out, you encounter three super Earth-sized planets. And they are, have orbital periods where this inner planet goes around twice for every one orbit here. And this one goes around uh, three times for every two orbits out here. So they're in a one to two to three period commensurability. And that particular arrangement of orbits, even though the planets are close to one another, is very stable over long time periods. But the problem is that in order to get those planets into that configuration, you have to very gently move them in. It can become unstable if you move them in too fast. So somehow, these planets formed much further away from their star and they somehow in concert together moved in in such a way that was smooth and gentle enough to preserve that one to two to three mean motion resonance, which is really confusing to us because I thought I just told you that whole story about how it's all very violent and dynamical. Now we have this story pushing us the other direction. And so science is ongoing. It's, we're constantly trying to answer questions and in the process two more new questions pop up. But we believe that we're seeing important clues about how the dominant planet formation process happens throughout the galaxy encoded in the architecture of this particular system. Another important thing about this system is that because we see five planets transiting Think about how flat that whole architecture has to be. If they were misaligned, if those planets were misaligned with respect to one another, there's no way you'd see all five of them lined up just along your line of sight and crossing in front of their star. And so that provides another important clue about the architectures of planetary systems. So with my collaborator Sarah Ballard at the University of Washington, um, we tried to take a look at the uh, distribution of the multiplicity of planets. So it's kind of a complicated way of saying just, you know, this many stars have six planets, this many stars have five planets, this four, three, two, and one planet transiting in our sample. And what we did is we constructed artificial planetary systems where we varied the amount of mutual alignment of the planets and we varied the typical number of planets in the system until we could find a good match. It's kind of fun, so you can just make all of these millions of, in, in, um, uh, millions of instances of planets, try to observe them just the way Kepler does. You see if what you recover from your simulations matches your observations, and it does pretty well when you have a kind of a mean uh, inclination distribution of about three degrees, which means very tightly um, uh, aligned with one another, and if each system contains something like six to seven planets. But looking at that, you might be a little bit dissatisfied because, whoa, it really misses the singleton systems there, right? 
So no matter what we did to these two parameters, we couldn't find a match to these bins and to this bin. So we decided, okay, well, let's tweak our model just a little bit. Let's just say that some fraction, oops, sorry, too many singles. Let's say that some fraction F of all of those planets are just in, um, are in multi-systems. And we'll use the, the alignment parameter and the number of planets parameter. And then one minus F, the leftovers of them, will be in singleton systems. And what we found was pretty remarkable. We found that half of the planetary systems are in very neatly aligned multiple planet systems, and half of them appear to be alone. So it looks like there is a dichotomy in the distribution of planets. And what's amazing is that's all encoded in those little dips that we see from that single-minded little telescope. We get all of this information about the typical alignment of the planets with respect to one another and the number of planets per system, number of planets per star, all of this wonderful information. And when we did this model, we actually were able to match these bins extremely well and this bin simultaneously. We find that there's something like six to seven planets per system and they're all aligned to within three to four degrees. And to give you a sense of context, the solar system is aligned within about seven degrees. All of the planets are in the same plane to within seven degrees. So in this one way, these, these alien planets look a little bit like the solar system. Each system contains a lot of planets and they're all well aligned. Um, here are the marginalized posterior distributions for any of the statistics aficionados in the room. This shows that they're all mostly aligned. This is the distribution of planets, so there's at least about four planets per star, but it ranges all the way up to eight planets per star, and about half of them are in the singleton systems and half are in the multi-systems. Um, oops, let me back, oh, here we go. Okay, and so the, after searching through them, we determined that we didn't really see anything that was in the habitable zone, but it turned out we kind of overlooked one. I'll be the first to admit it. We don't do everything perfectly. Another group uh, led um, by uh, um, uh, uh, was Eliza Quintana of the Kepler team um, looked at Kepler 186 and did a very beautiful detailed analysis of this particular system. And what they found was something that looked similar to the Kepler 32 system, five planets, all kind of Earth size are a little bit larger, but what they found was that one of them, this one here, which is about 1.1 Earth radii, resides right there in that Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot that all the water could be evaporated from its surface, not too far away that all the water would freeze out. It's just right. And it looks like it's right smack in the middle of this particular star's habitable zone, which is a really exciting discovery especially given that this planet, compared to the rest of the Kepler sample, is really close to the Earth. So what a wonderful discovery. And here it is compared to the solar system in terms of the incident flux normalized to the Earth. So this is the amount of light it receives from the central star. Here's the Earth in our solar system. There's Mercury, Venus, and Mars. And for, oh, so that's right, I had that backwards. The Earth is on the inner edge of our habitable zone. Mars is near the outer edge. And the Kepler-186 system has these four planets crammed in really close, and then it has a single habitable zone planet sitting out here, which is really cool. This planet, it is conceivable that it is a lot like Earth, has a thin atmosphere, it's sitting there basking in the warmth of its sun, and perhaps there's little critters wandering around on the surface, and perhaps enough time has elapsed for one of those critters to look up into the night sky and wonder, I wonder if there are other planets up there. It's pretty cool. So in another statistical study done by the other exoplanet group at Harvard, led by Dave Charbonneau, his graduate student, Courtney Dressing, looked at the fraction of the red dwarf stars in the Kepler sample that have habitable zone planets. And here is the stellar temperature. This really just kind of helps spread these dots out. And here's orbital period. And for each stellar system, here's the extent of its habitable zone. And you can see that there are planets residing in the habitable zone. Most of these are larger than the Earth, though, except for that one that I just showed you. And the end result of her analysis is something just remarkable to my mind. There are 0.56 habitable zone Earth-sized planets per star, per red dwarf star. So think about that. You look up, you grab a sample of 10 red dwarfs, Half of them have a habitable zone planet with a radius between 
half and 1.4 times the radius of the Earth. That's the stuff of Star Wars, you know? That's science fiction moving into science fact. This means that right next door, there's not just probably one habitable zone planet, there are habitable zone planets. And we are moving from this era that we were operating in where we were hunting around for planets. Now we're in the regime where we just need to get up there, reach up, and start gathering them from the sky. They're waiting for us to, to discover them. So um, let me just double check my time. I'm running a little short, so let me just give you a quick peek into the future. Um, I told you how Kepler died, and we have the uh, K2 mission. And the K2 mission is going to be looking at these various fields. Um, this is more interesting for astronomers. Just trust me that I'm showing you that it's going to point around in the sky. And um, what I'm excited about is that even though it, we, they figured out how to balance it into the stellar wind, there's still instability in the spacecraft. So when we got the light curves back, we were, well, they, they publicly released the data. My student, Andrew Vandenberg, was really excited. He was all waiting for it, so he had all the plotting routines ready. Pulled up the first light curve and it looked like this. And we're just like, oh, man, that's horrible. I mean, look at that. That's not noise. That's just it, it drifting, 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 bloop. What's that thing? And then drifting, <laughs> drifting down, and bloop. And so we thought, and we thought about it, and we thought, well, okay, let's think. I told Andrew, think about how the spacecraft works. What's it doing up there? So it's an unstable equilibrium balanced against the solar radiation. So it's kind of drifting, and then they have to fire their thrusters to realign. And so that's kind of what you're seeing there. And so Andrew thought, okay, well, let me look at what the, the star's position is doing in the x direction and the y direction. And sure enough, there's a star wandering across the chip in both the x and the y directions. So you can actually just turn that into a simple arc length across the detector, and it looks very nice and tidy. This is just the star wandering across a single little 24 micron pixel, just wandering back and forth. And it turns out that the flux level correlates with that position. So if you go along this arc length, you can watch the flux receive varying. And this is just the one single 24 micron pixels response function as the star moves across it, which is really cool. And so what you do is you just fit this function to it and you can correct it right out. And you go from this to this. And that rise is actually what the star is doing. It's probably a star spot moving across the face of the star. And so we were able to, um, right after the Kepler engineering test data were released, one graduate student, the power of one graduate student, was applied to this and we were able to solve the problem, recover the precision. Basically this plot just shows that we're getting about the same precision as the original Kepler mission and we are back in business. And so all those exciting results that I showed you of habitable zone planets around little red dwarfs, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We're looking forward to another two to three years of planet hunting or really planet harvesting, uh, so stay tuned. Um, just want to give a shout out to my entire group. I have a brilliant set of undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, and, 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 and senior scientists. Uh, we're kind of an organic mixture of expertise. We all gather once a week, we brainstorm, we come up with brand new ideas, we solve fun and interesting problems. And you can visit us at harvardxolab.org. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about stars, or planets, I worked with Jorge Cham of the PhD comics, uh, comic strip online. Um, so we put together these really beautiful animations that will teach you in the course of about six to eight minutes everything you want to know about stars and planets. So please take a look, hit like, share with your friends. And with that, thank you and I'll take your questions. So uh, I guess uh, I'll play, I'll do triage. So well, it looks I, like I get we have to, mic set up. Right? Yeah, but I get to okay. point. Oh, okay. Good. All right. So, <laughs> so um, uh, could you go to the mic though, so we can record it? So don't say anything, you know, untoward. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, very interesting uh, assessment of the exoplanet populations, et cetera. So can you? Give I'm us sorry, some... Jim. Could, Jim. Jim Head. Yep. Uh, yep. Teach planetary geosciences here okay. in the geology department. So the question is, uh, what's your insight on the origin of the architecture of our own solar system from all your work? Very simple. <laughs> oh, well, um, it looks like our solar system appears to be fairly unusual, it, especially compared to the population of planets that we've currently recovered. 
careful extrapolations of, the, of those architectures into the regime where our planets live still makes our planetary system look a little bit unusual. So in the context of all of the exoplanets, our solar system to me seems unusual for several reasons. We, um, uh, it has a habitable zone planet around a yellow dwarf G dwarf star. I don't know what we're doing here and not around a red dwarf. Um, the planetary system architecture um, is much more spread out than a lot of the planetary systems that we're seeing around other stars. They tend to be much more compact with lots of planets occupying um, at least mean motion, uh, or, or sorry, uh, period commensurabilities, if not mean motion resonances. Um, and then we have these hulking gas giant planets exterior to a bunch of little terrestrial planets. A lot of the times we're seeing you know, systems of gas giant planets that have completely cleared out inner solar systems. So we have this nice pristine, safe inner solar system where all the planets are on nice orderly circular orbits and nicely aligned with each other. It just kind of looks weird. Um, but I would say give us a little bit of time uh, and, and as our time baselines expand, we're gonna get a better view of the outer planetary system or architectures of these exoplanets. I'll be able to answer that a little bit better in the future. Just a quick follow up. Is yeah. there anything we can help you with in our exploration of this solar system that might give you insight into sorting out things in the other solar systems? Yeah, so, um, well, I think we need is a, is a formation mechanism for th this system that uh, also produces the huge amount of variety that we see in other systems. And it's my understanding that former solar system models are tuned to really reproduce this yeah. and this alone. Now the task is much more complicated. And so, you know, that would be wonderful, but I understand that I'm giving you a gigantic task. The other thing is that I would really, I personally would love to know as an astronomer, what are the conditions for life from both a formation perspective and a present day conditions perspective for our planet? It's, it's amazing to me that we don't fully understand that. And you know, yet we're re having press releases about habitable zone planets. Well, the search is on, so we hope to help you. Thanks. Excellent, I look forward to working with you. Thanks. Um, please. Hi, um, I, it wasn't clear to me from the uh, results that you've, uh, that you've presented how, uh, whether you'd be able to detect uh, uh, planets in a, f a formation like ours around a star like ours. Mm -hmm. It seemed as if you were um, you had found a, a special case that worked well. Yeah. And I wonder if you have some sense about of the context in which the special case fits. Uh, I mean, how special is it? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm taking the special case that you're referring to must mean that we're looking around these little small stars. So the habitable zones are in closer, and we have a chance of finding things in them. Right, the and, and original the, Kepler mission um, had been extended for the express purpose of looking for those Earths in the habitable zones of sun-like stars, because it turned out that the stars that we were studying were a little bit more noisy than we anticipated. So the Kepler team applied to NASA for an extended mission so they can gather more data, more transits for those planets out in one-year orbits, so they can then beat down the noise and perhaps take a peek at an Earth-sized planet out there and then the reaction wheel failed. And so you're right, we didn't actually get out all the way into the habitable zone of G-type stars. Now that's a bummer from the perspective of looking for planetary systems just like our own, but if by looking at only our planetary system around our yellow G-dwarf star is kind of a limited perspective. It's, it's very Terra-centric or human-centric. And um, I, I really kind of like our result in the sense that it is very general. It, it really talks about the majority of stars throughout the galaxy. And so that, I think that's how our results fit into it. Planet formation in a general sense happens mostly around red dwarf stars and produces systems of about five planets that are very well aligned and about the size of the Earth. I hope that answered your question. Okay, and please state your name. Doug, could you do that too, please? Oh, uh, my name's Tom Seguris. Okay, thank you, Tom. Please. Hello, I'm John from physics department. So I'm wondering, you soon have a collection of you know, planets in habitable zones. Uh -huh. So what do you have further plan to determine whether there's life actually on the planet? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't get to get into that in this talk, but that's something for the next decade is to, once we've gathered up all of these Earth-sized planets passing right in front of their stars, you can do something really fun, which is, um, during the transit, you take a very large space telescope with a spectrometer attached to it, and some of the light that's coming towards the Earth has to pass through that planet's atmosphere. 
and it picks up the atomic and molecular transitions of the species that are in the atmosphere. So if you subtract off the stars spectrum, what you're left with is the planet spectrum. And then you can go looking through the planet spectrum and you can start looking for things that um, look a little bit out of place for a planet of that composition unless there's something on the surface tossing additional chemicals up into it. And so in the most benign sense, you'd have bacteria that are doing what bacteria do, eating and then expelling gas and producing non-equilibrium amounts of methane, perhaps. And that's really the, what we're hoping to do with the James Webb Space Telescope. And right now, you can think of this work as the scouting mission for James Webb so that it can look for those so-called biosignatures. But uh, there's a recent paper done by my department chair who normally does cosmology, but he's this great thinker and he's an idea factor. His name is Avi Loeb. And he's working with an undergraduate student at Harvard and they came up with the idea of, well, let's not just stop at little microbes doing, tossing stuff up in the air. What if you have intelligent life down there and it's polluting its atmosphere? <laughs> we do it and we produce very detectable signals of things that do not normally happen on planets. And by the way, here's what its spectrum would look like. And so that would be pretty cool too. That would be, a, that would be more like SETI. So um, there's two ways right there to, to maybe look for a habitability or existence of life. A little bit follow up, do you think it's possible to make attempts to communicate or send signals to that star? Oh, why not? I mean, we actually tried once. Um, I can't remember what system we sent it to, but there's this huge radio telescope down in Puerto Rico called Arecibo. And it, normally it works in receiving mode. You wait for radio signals to come into it and you see where it came from and you study that area of space. Well, they reversed the whole process and sent this booming radio signal out through Arecibo and into space. Um, that signal's probably still on its way. <laughs> yeah, and if they replied, we're, we're waiting. It's a, it's a kind of an awkward conversation to have because you know, for some of these systems, they're tens of hundreds of light years away, so that signal takes tens or hundreds of years to even get there. And who knows if somebody's on the other line listening, right? And that's what we're trying to do here on Earth. Um, that's what the whole purpose of SETI is. We're trying to make sure that somebody's on the line when the aliens call. Yeah. That's my version of craziness. So <laughs> we can talk later. One other thing I just want to mention before the next question. I noticed that there are children in the audience. Uh, you saw John is uh, pretty good at what he does. Please oh, I love it when kids ask questions. Please yeah. be shy about uh, the kids getting up and asking questions, please. Most of the uh, questions that adults ask, I've heard. And not, uh, but the kids ask me questions, and I'm like, ooh, I haven't heard this one before. I can't wait to see what my answer will be. So come on up. Good day. I am Igor Plina. I am a graduate student at the physics of Brown department. Uh -huh. uh, well, one way for a planet to be habitable is to get warmth from the sun. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not wrong, another way is by using tidal forces of ah. uh, Jupiter-like planets. Yes. So what is the situation about that kind of research? Yes. Are we detecting some tidal warmth out there? That's a great point. Um, you're not only reliant on energy received from the sun, you can have the planet orbiting a, a planet and it can get deformed and squished and pulled, squished and pulled and like bending a coat hanger that generates heat and you can build up heat within the planet internally and we think that might be going on with Europa around Jupiter and maybe that's what you had in mind and um, there was a proposed mission to go to Europa with a big old drill. Um, I don't know where the status of that is because I don't actually work in planetary space flight, but it sounds like a wonderful idea to me. Um, it would be really cool if you actually drilled down, took a look, and there's something swinging by. Um, why not? I mean, we've drilled two miles into our own ice cap, and what did we find? We found a little shrimp sitting there looking back at the camera. What was it doing down there? But life finds a way. So um, that's really cool. Now, in terms of detecting that astrophysically, then I think we would have to infer that there are tidal forces operating. But we, there's no way that we could probably pick up that thermal signature of that a little bit of additional heat. And so what we would need is for life to be taking advantage of that and then producing byproducts that then get into an atmosphere. And then we would need that moon of that planet to pass in front of the star which is not as far-fetched as it might sound because one of the postdocs at Harvard right now is working on searching for transiting moons in the Kepler and K2 data. And I think there's, there's no reason why not to figure that there might be a habitable zone moon around one of the giant planets that we've already found. That would be very cool. Um, but then detecting life on it, that's a whole other problem. But great question. Thank you. Over here. Oh. Hi, Professor. Uh, my name's Martin. Um, 
I was wondering um, why is that m more Earth-like planets out there uh, than the gas giant when the universe is full of ingredients for the gas giant, the hydrogen, uh, yeah. and there's much less metal for the ingredients of Earth? Very good question. Yes, that's a good insight. Um, the universe is filled predominantly by about 70% hydrogen, about 30% helium, rounded up to one significant figure, and then about 1% of trace metals that go into forming everything else in this room. And so the question, you know, that's a great question. Like, why aren't more, there more gas giants? Well, I think it's, it gets to this bottom-up planet formation process. We, there used to be two competing theories for how planets formed. It could have been that that protoplanetary disk got gravitationally unstable and it collapsed on itself and formed a planet. And then it would form gas giants readily. You should see them all the time. The other competing model started with the collisional buildup of little dust grains, literally forming little dust bunnies until you get up to pebbles and bigger and bigger and bigger things. And the idea to, of how you form a gas giant planet by that collisional buildup is that you need to build up about 10 Earth masses of solid material before you get an instability in the surrounding gas, forcing it to prefer to go onto the planet than going towards the star, essentially, or orbiting the star for that matter. So getting up to 10 Earth masses is a huge challenge. You can see from that distribution of planetary masses, it just doesn't happen very often. But once it does reach that critical mass, then you get runaway gas accretion and you readily form a gas giant planet like Saturn or Jupiter or even bigger. So I think that that mass distribution is a really strong hint that that's the dominant formation channel, bottom up rather than top down. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Brandon. I am a first year undergraduate at Brown. And my question is, um, it's more oriented towards the search for life in extraterrestrial planets. Um, life as we know it on Earth is composed mainly of carbon-based life forms, but I've read this theory um, one other place, I can't remember what the source is, but... Um, the internet. It, yeah, the internet. <laughs> so I've read that um, by virtue of being in the same group as carbon, we might we might be able to find silicon-based life forms. Okay. Um, do you think that the conditions on extraterrestrial planets um, might be suitable to um, hosting silicon-based life forms? Yeah, I mean, I think everything is pretty much open at this point. And, um, and I, I say that without any, you know, I'm not trying to be funny at all. I mean, I really think everything that we found about exoplanets so far has, um, I'd say basically everything we find has been a surprise in the sense that no theorists predicted it really well. And then after we found a few weird things and the theorists thought, okay, let's go ahead and revise things. We were wrong, okay, fine, let's go ahead and come up with a new theory. There we go, world, sparkling new theory, matches those observations. And then the observers go out, grab a few more observations, like, ah, oh, seriously, ah, toss that one out, <laughs> let's try it again. And so we have been surprised and surprised again. We really thought we understood this whole planet formation business uh, and so, now, now you're asking about what's on the surface of those surprising, weird, weird alien planets. And so I'm saying, really, I think everything's up in the air. If physics allows for it, it seems that the universe is very clever at using those laws of physics to come up with some really interesting stuff. Some of the highlights I didn't even show in here is there are, there's a whole class of planets that Kepler's discovered, which are circumbinary Tatooine-like planets. Um, there are, uh, we have, Stars that eclipse each other and then eclipse another star in the middle. Uh, we have stars that pulsate and their pulsation pattern gives rise to like a heart symbol in your light curve. It's the heartbeat star. And, we don't, and it's so many surprises just in the basic stellar astrophysics and basic like bulk planet formation that when you get down to asking questions about what can be on the surface, use your imagination and the laws of physics and I bet you it's out there somewhere. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, so any more? Again, really, I mean, I've seen John answer kids' questions. And they're really, it's really cool. So anybody care to get up? I'm frightening the young people. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, Uncle Chris, sorry. <laughs> All right, so John, th are, is that a question? Is it, okay, we have one more question? Can, I think, unless you're leaving, in which case, out. <laughs> Let's do one more. Hey, one. Please. Okay. Uh, my name is Sean, and uh, my question is: uh, You talked about two different theory, uh, two different ways to detect planets. I'm wondering if there's any other ways to detect planets that we uh, have tried and failed, or if there's any ways that we might do oh, in yeah. the future that yeah, we haven't question. tried yet. 
Yeah, so we did the, the reflex motion, the Doppler technique. So we're looking for stellar wobbles. We did the transit technique, which is basically looking for planet eclipses. Um, you can take a picture of the star, and if you look really carefully and you do all your measurements just right, you can maybe see the picture of a little dot of light sitting right next to the star. This works particularly well when planets are young. When planets are young, they start out big and puffy and they contract under their own gravity. And as they're contracting, they give off thermal emission, which makes them shine brighter than they would, than our own Jupiter would, for example. Um, so that is led, we have direct detections of something like 10 planets, but anyone you would ask about those 10 would probably have issues with like three or four of them because maybe they're too massive or they're out at 100 AU away from their star. It looks too weird. Um, but we do have direct images of planet-sized objects. Uh, and then the fourth technique that has been successful in finding planets is actually going to be part of a physics symposium on Thursday. My postdoc, Jennifer Yee, will be here. And she's going to talk about how planets can bend space-time and how we can detect that. And we found that far more than you might imagine. And so basically when a star uh, such as, like, let's say, like me, I'm a star. No, I'm just passing in front of the background star like Chris, and you're looking towards us. The mass of my head can take light shining from Chris's head, and it actually diverts that light into your light path. So that light that would have gone like this gets bent into your line of sight. So as I pass by, Chris gets brighter, brighter, and then he fades away as I pass by. Now, if I have a little planet trailing me, then first, Chris gets brighter and then fainter, and then the planet gets in on the act and causes a secondary little blip. And from the shape of that blip and the timing of that blip compared to the primary, you can actually get the distance of the planet to the star, you can get its mass ratio, and if that light curve has little specific inflections, it actually belies a little bit of orbital motion from the planet, so you can get things like its eccentricity and its orbital period. It's really cool stuff. So uh, if you're around and interested in that physics uh, symposium, it's on Thursday at 1 p.m. by Jennifer Yee. 723 Barriston Hall. Okay, great. Uh, before, uh, let me ask a question. Mike, what's our time? Okay, so five minutes. Um, so one and then two. Excellent. So I don't know much about um, solar, solar systems, but- I'm still learning too, it's okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, you mentioned how there's like relatively a lot of um, solar systems like ours, oh. that's what you're saying. Uh, so, not a lot like ours actually. Ours is pretty well, rare. unique, right? Yeah, yeah. But like, little similar to like Earth. How do you detect like if there's like possible hazardous um, like gases, for example, carbon monoxide or things like that? How do you um, know like if it's just right for life? Oh yeah, right. So I, I, I hinted at like that if it passes in front of the star, you can look and see the the spectrum. And, and so I didn't go into that in great detail. So what you're actually looking for is that within the planet's atmosphere there are atoms and molecules, and they have quantum transition. So if a photon with energy hits that atom, then its electron pops up in energy level. So you have this atom in an excited state and then it decays down and it, pat and it sends that light off in some other direction. So if you have some molecule of say carbon monoxide or methane in the atmosphere, then a photon can hit it and it can send that molecule tumbling and it takes the light out of that path. So what you do is you look through the star spectrum, that, remember I showed that spectrum, that rainbow, and you look for the missing light in just the right place for say carbon monoxide or ozone or methane or other exotic species that might be produced by life. You can just read it right off the spectrum, just like I read off sodium and magnesium and hydrogen and all of that in that spectrum. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, so Javier, you'll close us out. Hello, how are you doing today? My name is Javier Leonardo. Uh -huh. um, I'm a, year, a Europe student. Um, my question is, um, with all the prog progress that you have made, I commend you on that and the information you brought to us right. today. Yeah. Um, my question is, what progress do you see us making in the next 50 years? Oh. And if we do find a planet with sustainable life, how long would it take to reach that planet? Yeah, wow. Okay, 50 year vision. Yes. Here it goes, all right. <laughs> now I think, well, you know, we, let me take you through the next 15 years, all right? So we have K2, and it's gonna go for another two, maybe three, maybe four years. Uh, in 2017, uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Sky Survey, or Survey Satellite, TESS, anyway, T-E-S-S, -S, that will launch. Um, and that's going to provide us with an all-sky view of transiting planets around all the bright nearby stars. 
So that's going to provide lots of material for the 2018 to 2019 launch of James Webb Space Telescope, which will allow us to start looking for those biosignatures I was just talking about uh, around a handful of planets. We're going to have to be very careful in selecting those planets because it's going to take a lot of telescope time, and there's a lot of astronomers that want to use the James Webb Telescope for other things. So we had to be kind of courteous of that. Um, after that, then there's the European Plato mission, which is another transit, all-sky transit survey mission. So uh, for the next 15 years, it's transits, transits, transits. We're going to need to do a lot of radial velocity follow-up to get their masses. And I really start, um, my, our goal for the next 10 to 15 years is to really start understanding those tweener planets that are in between Neptune and Uranus and the terrestrial planets like Earth. That, that is a big jump from about 15 Earth masses down to about one Earth mass. That's not in our solar system. But there's tons of these super Earths or mini Neptunes out there. And I really want to get to understand what those things are. Are those failed gas giant planets? Are they planets into them, unto themselves? Could they be habitable? They're pretty they're numerous. So then after that, um, I believe that there's going to be some dedicated missions that are probably launched to look for those biosignatures. I think that there will be, I would say, within 20 years, you're going to probably see a big headline for a very tentative detection of a biosignature in some planet's atmosphere, and everybody's going to freak out. It's going to be press release heaven. And you're going to see it in the New York Times, and you're going to see it splashed across all these magazines, and Time Magazine, and Newsweek, and it's going to make the news. And in the scientific community, I think there's going to be a ton of debate. Some people will believe it, and some people won't believe it, and some people say that they see it in their data, and some people say they can't confirm it in their data. Some people are going to look at the original data and say, we didn't even see it in the original data. And then it'll all kind of die down. And then next five years after that, it'll get taught in intro astro courses, and students will be annoyed that they have to remember the name of that star for a test. And <laughs> then, this is how science works, guys. He asked. So then, then this is my prediction, all right? So I'm extrapolating further. About 30 years from now, um, one of my, uh, well, maybe my kid. Let's just say it's my kid. My kid uh, then is, becomes a professor at Princeton. And, um, <laughs> And, you know, because we've got to spread it around, you can't have all talent concentrated in one place. And, uh, and then he goes out and he finds 10 planets, and each one of them has tentative evidence of biosignatures. And then we're able to make the statistical claim that some percentage of planets have habitable, are inhabited. And then that gets extrapolated throughout the entire galaxy. And then we start having this amazing picture of life throughout the universe. And then we realize, wait a second, there's all this life out there, but nobody contacted us. <laughs> Where, we've been looking. I mean, there's all these shows about UFOs and there's just, just terrible. There's no evidence in those things. And um, there's no aliens. And then we're going to be really confused. And then we're going to start wondering if our place in the universe as sentient beings capable of observing it is a total statistical fluke that probably happens maybe once per galaxy. And then what would that mean? That would be heavy. So, you know, I'm dreaming, I'm extrapolating, I'm looking forward. I only got out to about 30 years. That's my picture. Thanks right. for asking. And I think that's a Thank great you. place to end. Thank, Thank you so much.